say, oh, will you tell me about your family background, the names of your parents, and where you were born and when, basic stuff? Well, I was born in Huanusco, Zacatecas. Uh, my father, Eliseo Medina, and my mother, Guadalupe Medina. Uh, we living in Zacatecas uh, forever, and my father used to come to the United States uh, first as a bracero, mm -hmm. and then as an undocumented worker. And uh, this was, uh, I was born in 1946, and there were, uh, Five, sib uh, five of us in the family. I was number four out of five. Okay. And you came to the United States later to be with your father? If you brought the family or how did that work? Yeah, the, my, uh, my father used to come and visit us. He l lived and worked in the U.S. Uh, around uh, Kern County and uh, up in San Joaquin County. Uh, in Stockton, and then he would send money back to us, but he would go visit us like every uh, one or two years. And then eventually my mother and he decided that the whole family would come to the United States. So we left Wanusco in 1954. We, got a, we sold our chickens, our, our donkey, and we sold everything that we had. And then we got on a bus and uh, headed north and we stopped in Tijuana, mm -hmm. and my father took us and got us a place to live uh, right on the line, right on the border with the, uh, between the U.S. And, and Mexico. And then at night, he crossed back into the U.S. to go to Delano to work and send money to us, and the rest of us stayed behind in Tijuana. Uh, and my mother went into the consulate and began the process for us immigrating uh, to the U.S. Took us about two years. Uh, at the time, we were living like many families in, in Tijuana, just on waiting for the time that we would get an appointment with the immigration services. Mm -hmm. And in 1956, we finally all got our, our green cards. My father then crossed back to Mexico. Uh, so the, and then we went, moved over, crossed into the U.S. Uh, together. Took a bus and uh, he took us to Delano, uh, California, and uh, he had already rented a house, and so that's how we got to Delano in 1956. And uh, so you started school in Delano. Well, y yes. Uh, uh, when when we got there, the Three youngest uh, kids uh, went to school. Uh, I was placed in the fourth grade because, uh, because I spoke no English and didn't know anything, so they just put me in the fourth grade. And my brother and my sister were also placed in, uh, in their different grades mm -hmm. because my sister was younger and my brother was older. So how old were you when you crossed? Pardon? How old were you when you crossed? I was 10 years old. 10? Mm-hmm. And then what, what was a, a life like for you in Delano? Just maybe a, a daily routine if you had one. Well, you know, we normally what would happen is my, my mother would wake everybody up around uh, 5 in the morning uh, because she got up and started making lunch for herself, my father, and my older sisters who were going to go work in the fields. Uh, the three, the three uh, youngest kids, uh, we were awake, but uh, then we had to get ourselves ready for school and make our own lunch, and then we would walk to school. Uh, we went to Fremont School in Delano, which was maybe about a, a half a mile from where we lived. Then we would be in school, then we would come home, and uh, uh, then my parents would get home about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and we would, uh, then my mother would then cook dinner for us, yeah. and that was pretty much our, uh, our days. Uh, and, and your father was working in the grapes? 
my mother, my father, yeah. and my two sisters working in the, in the gray they fields. Were all during in the gray. The, they would work of, uh, depending on the season. Mm -hmm. You know, it was during the <clears throat> the winter they worked in the pruning and tying the grapevines. Yes. Then in in the spring they would work in the thinning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and pulling leaves from around the grapevine so mm -hmm. that in order to make room for them and they would get exposed to the sun. And then uh, uh, starting around July, then the harvest would start and they would work in the, uh, they would work in uh, picking grapes until about uh, October. Then uh, it was the off period, so then they would go pick oranges uh, the rest of the, the year until the, uh, the pruning season started again. And that was pretty much a routine. The only exception was during the summer, we would all pack up and go to, uh, to uh, Fowler, California, where there was uh, going to be a two to three week season of picking raisin grapes. Mm -hmm. So when we were let out of school, we would all go over and the whole family would work uh, picking grapes, uh, raisins. Uh, and because uh, Fowler was about 70 something odd miles from Delano, mm -hmm. we would uh, stay at this was at, at the farmer's uh, uh, ranch where he had a barn that he had sectioned off into little rooms and the walls, uh, the sections were about like maybe uh, six feet high. And then they had uh, boxes of uh, uh, that they put the raisins in, then we would turn them over, they were big boxes, mm -hmm. and those were our beds. And then uh, my mother had a little uh, kerosene stove where that she cooked food for us. And that was it, you know, we got up early in the morning, we went and picked raisins and then came home and my mother would cook dinner for us and we would, that was our routine until we uh, went back to Delano when the, uh, it was time to go back to school. And, and then it wasn't long before you started working in the grapes also, am I correct? Well, I, I actually started working when I, uh, when I was 10. My father would take me and my brother to work with him uh, because at that time, women were not hired to do uh, pruning of the vines. Mm -hmm. It was only men's work at that time. So my father would take us to with him. He called it enseñándonos a trabajar. He was teaching us how to work. Mm -hmm. And so both my brother and I would work with him and uh, he would cut the vines and then we would pull the vines off of the, the wires and, uh, and spend the day with him all, all day Saturday and, and half a day on Sunday usually. And and so, and during school vacations, we were working the fields as well as on, on weekends. We would go out either picking cotton in Corcoran uh, with my father, or we would uh, go uh, pick peas. Uh, and every once in a while, we could go out and also do peaches or tomatoes. But our primary crops that we work with the, were the grapes and the, and the oranges. But you didn't, as a family, uh, except for when you went to Fowler, follow the grapes, you stayed in Delano the whole right. time, right? Yeah, because you could actually wind up uh, working uh, anywhere about around nine months out of the year, you'd have work. Then the rest of the time when there was no work and things were really hard, uh, we would occasionally go and the federal government would have, uh, would give out surplus food and then and, and because there was no income coming in because mm -hmm. there was no such thing as unemployment insurance for farm workers mm -hmm. and you were living from paycheck to paycheck so we would go and get some of that surplus government food you know the cheese and some god unknown meat <laughs> the canned meat that they would give us it was terrible but yeah. hey it was food yeah and so that's what we did and, uh, and we just basically lived in the lane of year round. And so you were working in the fields um, when you had the accident and broke your leg, right? Yes. And so can you pick up the story from there? You were home. Yeah. Well, you know what, what happened after I... Did I miss a bunch of time or is it... Yeah, when I was... Uh, 
Uh, I actually mm -hmm. was graduated out of uh, Freeman School after the eighth grade. I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Then I left uh, school and to work full time in the fields. And uh, so I started working grapes and tomatoes and all of that. And then in, nine, this was in 1961. So 1965, I had been working in the grape fields and then I had an accident where I got hit by a car and broke my leg. So I had been home and then we started hearing about how there was a, a union, you know, because all of us were very dissatisfied with the way we were treated. You know, I was earning like a 90 cents an hour. Uh, that was not unusual. Uh, if you complain, you get fired. If uh, and, uh, there was very seldom was there cool drinking water. There was no toilets in the fields, nothing. And again, if you complain, they said, if you don't like it, quit. There's somebody else that will take your job. Mm. So I didn't think there was anything we could do about it, even though we were unhappy with that. And, but then one day, when I went to a, a store, I picked up a copy of a, a publication called El Malcriado. I'd never seen it, but ever since I, I was very young, I loved to read. So I looked at it, it seemed very interesting, it was 10 cents, so I bought one, took it home, and I read it. And it was about this thing called the National Farm Workers Association, uh, which I had never heard of. And it had stories in there about how it was a union, uh, an organization to protect uh, uh, workers' rights, farm worker rights, mm -hmm. and it had a story about a, a, a rent strike that had been going on in a little town called Woodville. Mm -hmm. and it was led by somebody named Gilbert Padilla, mm -hmm. and, and the stories about how this guy Cesar Chavez was taking on uh, the growers, and I was fascinated. Even though I wasn't working at the time, when I read it is that for the first time there were stories about how Mexicans were standing up and fighting for their rights, which was an unheard of thing for me and for most of my fellow workers. Because we were immigrants and we thought, you know, when we came to this country, we were told to raise our hand up and say we would obey all the laws, blah, 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 of this country. And uh, we had experience with the, the, the border, the, the migra, the border patrol, where they would come and knock on our doors at 2 a.m. And, and sometimes they took people out of their houses and, and, and they got deported. There were times when they set up roadblocks on the way to go to work. So we were all afraid, I was afraid, uh, that if we did anything to step out of line, that we would be arrested and deported. So even though I was fascinated by what I read, I was scared to get involved, and my mother kept saying, ooh, that's a good thing, you ought to join it. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, yeah, I don't think so, I'll, I'll join if I have to, but I'm not gonna join if I... And then one day I'm at home, and my mother and my sister, and you know, I, was, I had a cast on my leg because of my broken leg, and I was watching I Love Lucy uh, on television, my mother and my sister walked in and say, we're on strike, we're on strike. And I said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean you're on strike? Yeah, the Filipinos walked out and we walked out with them. So we're on strike. We're demanding that we be paid a dollar and, and uh, 40 cents an hour. And so we're on strike. And I was so excited. I mean, you know, because we had been hearing about the pass about a strike that had happened in Coachella. And, and it was like a, some real sense of something big was gonna happen. There was in the air, there was this energy, and we weren't quite sure it was. So when my mother came home, say we're on strike, it sort of like the bomb went off. And, and she says, yeah, people are marching in the streets. And then I, so I got my crutches and I went and got in my car and I went out and sure enough, about a, less than a mile from our house, there was this march of people were uh, walking down the middle of the street with signs and saying, join us, we're on strike. And I, I'd never seen anything like that. I'd seen the, the, the marches on television that the, in, in the South, and it looked scary, but I was 
fascinated by the idea that people could stand up and fight for their rights. And when they were saying, join us, join us, I said, eh, I'm not sure I want to do that. I said, so uh, that was my first exposure to the Farm Workers Union and the Grape Stripe. And then from there, the next thing we heard is that there was going to be a union meeting, a strike meeting. And it was going to happen on September the 16th, which, as you know, is Mexican Independence Day. That's a day when all of us from Mexico are full of revolutionary fervor and, 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 and <laughs> uh, a sense of who we are. And so I thought, this is amazing. And the, the, the meeting was going to take place at our, the, our Lady of Guadalupe Church. So I got on my crutches and I went to this meeting. And it was being held in the community hall. I walked in the door, and the place was jammed. I mean, every seat was taken. People were standing around the edges in the room. And there was this huge excitement. People were chanting, and they were uh, saying, Viva la huelga, viva la causa. And I'm just, my eyes were big, because I never, ever experienced anything like that. Ever. And then I said, this guy Cesar Chavez must be an incredible person to be doing all of this. I just thought he must be like eight feet tall <laughs> and he must be this great big powerful person, you know, with a deep voice or like the voice of God, like James Earl Jones, something yeah. like that. And, and I was amazed and I, I was just couldn't s sit still. And then a guy got up and started speaking, and he looked very distinguished. He looked like David Niven, you know, with a, the mustache and the whole bit. And I thought, that must be Cesar Chavez. Uh, but then he says, and now I want to introduce Cesar Chavez. Which and I Cesar be, Chavez you. walks up, and he's like five feet five, very soft-spoken. And I was saying, oh, man, how can this be Cesar Chavez? What happened to the deep voice and the big eight-foot person guy. <laughs> I was a little bit disappointed. And then Cesar started talking, and he started talking about how even though we were poor, that we were entitled to be treated with respect and with dignity, that the fact that we had to sell our labor didn't mean that the growers owned us that we had the right to stand up for ourselves. And I forgot all about how short he was <laughs> and how soft-spoken he was. All I could just start saying, this guy is speaking to me. He's speaking about who we are and what we should be treated like in this country. And I was, I was sold. I mean, there was a vote that was taken to join the strike, but by then, it, to me, it didn't matter. I mean, I was sold. To me, this, this was an incredible experience. And so next morning, I, I broke up. I, I have a question about yeah. the end of the meeting. Was one of the people that I interviewed years ago said that at the end, that Susser said, now, this is not going to be easy. We don't have a strike fund. You're going to lose all your money if you join. But you'll have to decide whether it's the right thing to do or not. Because he was talking about joining the Filipinos in their strike. And then he handed the microphone over to someone. And I've been led to believe that that was Epifanio Camacho. And Epifanio started spitting fire and brimstone and got the crowd into it and all the shouting for Welga started again. Is that right? Yes. Huh. If you if you ever met Epifanio, Epifanio was this guy, the big guy, muscular, mm -hmm. and he started, I mean, he started preaching about rights and the revolution and we have to stand up for ourselves. I mean, the whole place was going wild. Uh -huh. I mean, and 
uh, it was academic when it, uh, they called for a vote. I mean, people were ready. They wanted to do this. And Epifanio, you know, was, it, the match was lit. Epifanio just bailed gasoline on that fire because uh -huh. uh, with, uh, with his speaking, and it was it just a uh, foregone conclusion. You know, uh, everybody voted unanimously. Yes, we're going to strike. We're going to do it. And, and because it, it was much more than it in my later experience of running uh, strike votes, this was not just about wages anymore. This was about who we were, mm -hmm. what we wanted, and what we expected as human beings. It was about dignity. It was about respect. And at that point, you know, we're, nobody was going to go back. We knew where we had been. Now we had a glimpse of where we wanted to go. And Epifanio and, and, and Caesar and everybody else that was there, and, and when they talked, it became very clear uh, what this was about. Was that Gilbert Padilla that introduced Caesar? Yeah, I little... didn't know who it was until later. Well, yeah. Until later when I yeah. first, uh, when I met him. Okay. And there's one other guy that I wanted to ask you about uh, that I became fairly close to, or that's Julio Hernandez. Mm -hmm. And it, somehow he gets dropped out of most of the stories about the uh, union. A and he had a story somewhat similar to yours that your mother was saying, you should do this, and you're going, mm, I don't know. He said, every time Cesar came to his house in the early days, he took off out the back door. <laughs> and finally, his wife told him, look, this guy's a good guy. You need to talk to him. And then he threw in with Cesar after that, or Cesar after that, and helped him organize, I think it was in Pixley. Um, uh, well, I mean, he Bef was in Corcoran. Corcoran, Corcoran yeah. Yeah. Be before the, yeah. even before the meeting to get. Well, you know, my, uh, I, I knew Julio, you know, I met him uh, during the course and, and his wife, Fina, Fina. Uh, was Fina yeah. Hernandez. Yeah. And Fina was a real pistol. Yeah. I mean, she was the yeah. Hueso Colorado, yeah. you know, she was really committed. And I heard that story from uh, from Julio himself, who yeah. told me that he didn't want to get involved with any of this stuff, and then he tried to ducking Caesar, but Caesar wasn't going to be uh, giving up. I, uh, when he thought somebody uh, was good, he was going to stay on him, and he was smart enough to be able to figure out who was a real <laughs> decision maker in that yeah, household. Yeah. And then, and uh, once he got Fina on board, Fina did the rest and got Julio on board. Uh, yeah. Julio had been in an earlier strike, yeah. and then he got blackballed in Dinuba or in the, in the valley, and they yeah. had to move north to find work. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the San Joaquin Valley had a long history of workers organizing and striking, and it wasn't about a union, it was just trying to get more money out of the growers, and it was very simple, you know, if you were trouble, you got blackballed, you didn't mm -hmm. have a job anymore. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just with that grower, it would happen in that whole area and sometimes mm -hmm. people had to leave the area and go somewhere else to get another job because they couldn't uh, work anymore in that area. And so Julio had good reason, unlike me who had no, no sense, because mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was 19 years old, what yeah. did I know? <laughs> All I knew is what my heart said, Julio had had ex experiences and and he had to be convinced. But boy, once he got convinced, Julio was in there full full on, you know. And he did serve on the first executive board, did he not? Well, Julio was actually before there was an executive board that was formed for the National Farm Workers Association. Yes, when they got. Uh, formalized in 1962, 
Julio had been Caesar's organizer in, 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 in Corcoran, like Dolores had been his organizer in Stockton, Gilbert had been his organizer in Los Baños and in the, uh, and in the Fresno area, uh, and Richard had been uh, his contact in Delano. So Caesar had all of these contacts all over the state where they had chapters of the CSO, the Community Service Organization, mm -hmm. and then when he left CSO, they continued then working with this association with a dream of someday having a union with, God knows what, they had no resources, they had <laughs> nothing except a, this idea that that's what we're gonna be doing. And Julio was on the first board that was elected in 1962, as was uh, Gilbert, Gilbert yeah. and, uh, Dolores. And, and Dolores and uh, um, uh, Roger Terrones and uh, I think Antonio Rendine came a little bit later, but he was also one of the first ones that were involved with that. Any questions yet? Well, no. I mean, just continue the narrative, right? You were okay. saying that you were saying that 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 after you went into into the meeting at the church, then what happened next? Well, you know, I left that meeting. I mean, I was sold. So the next morning, you know, I had. I had a little piggy bank where I threw in all my spare change. So I went the very next morning, September 6th, 17th, I went and broke open that piggy bank and then I went over to the pink house, uh, not the pink house, it was at the, the, the NFWA office on, on, on Albany Street. And I walked in and I took in and, and the dues were $3.50 a month. I took $9.50 from my piggy bank. I went and joined and paid my first three months union uh, dues to the association and became a member uh, then. And I never looked back after that. Uh, I got asked to go out and, and help pick it and I would do that. And well, the first thing I did is that when I got, was able to go to work after, uh, afterwards, uh, instead of working in the grape fields, I then decided that I would not be a strike breaker. So I went and got a job in Wasco, uh, working at a nursery, uh, along with my brother-in-law and, and his brothers. And we were like a little team of four that would every day drive 30 miles outside to go to work because that wasn't being struck. Or the, only, the only thing being struck was the grapes. But during the weekends and all of that, they asked me to do stuff to help in the union. So uh, Jim Drake once uh, put me in a car and, and on his Chevy Nova and we drove up to UCLA to speak to students. Uh, and we had a big old union banner that I had, that I, I was on the passenger side. I had to be holding on it because it was too <laughs> big to fit in the Chevy Nova. So I was holding on to it while we were driving down the, the, the highway to to Los Angeles, and so I went in, and I would hold the uh, the banner while uh, Jim would speak. A couple of times, he stuck the microphone in my face, and uh, I was uh, very nervous, and I, I didn't like that because another time I got asked by Dolores uh, to go with her to Los Angeles. We we're going to stop the grapes in uh, at uh, at uh, in, in in San Pedro. Uh, so I went with her and. She drove me up and put me by uh, one of the piers and said, stay here. If you see him try to load grapes on that ship, you stop him. She didn't tell me how. She just <laughs> said, do that. And she drove off. So I stayed there all day waiting by that ship, waiting to see if anybody would try to load grapes. I had no clue what I would do if I, they ever showed up with a ship and the grapes to load. But nobody came. So I was there, and she didn't leave me no lunch, didn't leave me nothing. She just left me there to stop to sell grapes. And then she uh, returned about 6 o'clock at the evening, about 11 hours after she dropped me off. And she says, did anybody come? Oh, no, I said, nobody. Okay, well, get in. Come on, let's go. And off we went. So <laughs> I got to, uh, on my off, off times, I would go do all stuff like that. and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, because, uh, for the union, and I would not miss any of the Friday night meetings that uh, the union started having at the Filipino Hall. And uh, 
those were really fun. They were just incredible because all these people from all over the uh, the country and all over California would come and and then the Teatro Campesino would perform. It was the liveliest, the most fun things that ever happened in Delano. It was a combination of, of rally, of religious service, of a, and of a, of a theater, and it was just an, an incredible, incredible atmosphere, it, it, one of those things. And so I did all of that uh, uh, all the way until 1966, you know, for about six months. I was just volunteering whenever they needed me. So how did you decide to, how, do, how were you recruited to organize? Well, you know, during all of these things, I had met Caesar, I had met Dolores, and, and Dolores sort of adopted me. Uh, uh, and then my, the, where I was working in the nursery, I got bored with working there. Yeah, I was. What were I, you doing there? Grafting you know, we or? Put, we've, uh, uh, the, the, nurse, the nursery, you know, had fruit trees uh -huh. that you would pull out and then sort them by size. Uh, for shipment out to other nurseries oh. in the cities. They had rose bushes mm -hmm. that then you had to pull out of the ground and again sort them and by size and all of that and prepare them for shipment. Uh, so that, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, other times we would be planting uh, uh, pieces of, 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 uh, of uh, grape canes and to the ground in order to create new new little grapevines that then would be sold to the growers. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that and I got bored with doing that. And, and so, one, uh, but by that time, the union had won its first contract with the Shenley Corporation. Mm -hmm. And they, were, they and the Shenley was a wine company and they picked uh, the, the grapes by, uh, by the piece. You get paid by how much you picked when mm -hmm. you fill the trailer full of, uh, of grapes. Mm -hmm and uh, con candolas. So uh, I said to, my, to the other guy, I said, look, why don't we, I know somebody at the union. Maybe we can get a job at, at Shenley when the harvest starts. And they said, that's a good idea. So there's three of us, we just need to find a fourth and then we'll have a crew. So I said, I'll, I'll go do it. You know, here I thought I'd be, I know an influencer and yeah. I, can, I can get, <laughs> I can make a deal and get a job. So I went into the union office and I saw Dolores and I said, Dolores, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I don't, I just quit my job at the nursery and, you know, and what I'd like to do is uh, see if you can get, uh, if I can get in to work at Shenley. She said, oh, sure, of course, but, you know, the harvest isn't starting for another month. So why don't you come and help us? Uh, we're having an election at the DiGiorgio company. Why don't you come and help us as an organizer and then when, when the harvest starts, then you'll get your gondola. And I, I said, well, I'm, I don't have anything to do. This is July. Uh, this, this is June. The harvest doesn't start until mid-July or thereabouts. Sure, I'll help you. Uh, when's the election? Oh, it's August 30th. But come and help us in, until the harvest. So I said, okay. So I got recruited to be an organizer. I had no clue what an organizer did. I had no <coughs> clue what an election was. I didn't know nothing other than I thought I was going to do this until the harvest began. And so I became a union organizer for the union. Uh, and I was going to be a paid union organizer, $5 a week. And that was, <coughs> that was my, the beginning of my career. So, anything? Oh. Um, so, um, Oh my God, I'm losing track of it. Would you, would you help me? Well, so it, when in that period when you were getting ready to be, an, or trying to figure out how to be an organizer, did you spend a lot of time on the picket lines and stuff like that? Well, at that time, it, uh, uh, the, the, there was about 40 of us that were training as organizers with Fred Ross. Uh -huh. And our full-time job is there was going to be, uh, this was going to be an election that I didn't know was unique then, but it entailed 
the people that were going to be able to vote is the people that were working at the time, mm -hmm. plus people that had walked out on strike initially that were no longer employed at the company but uh, were deemed to be eligible because of they had been on strike. And these people had scattered all over the, the U.S. or uh, some even going back to Mexico. So these two groups were going to be uh, voting. So there were two teams. Uh, there were a team of uh, uh, those of us that would be going to work with the existing workforce while somebody else would go and canvas everywhere in search of all the people that had uh, worked there but were no longer at the company. So my job is every morning we'd start uh, with um, a meeting uh, in the morning with Fred Ross and uh, he had a system where he had little cards, in index cards, with the name of the person, where they lived, if they lived at the camp of the company or they lived in town, and then what he would assign us every day, okay, you gotta go see these people today, and when you talk to them, you make little notations, what they said to you, what you said to them, put the date when you saw them and what time, and then uh, every then it, it, we would go out in teams uh, of two uh, to go do house calling. I didn't know what house calling was, and, that's, uh, and so we go and we look to them. If they lived in camp, we would go to the camp and after work and try to talk to them, and then we'd come back in the evening, and Fred would ask each one of us to report on who we'd seen, what they said, what we said, and then he would listen to us and then would say, well, gee, you shouldn't have son, son that, or you should have said this, or you should have said that. And, and so he was teaching us about how to actually go out and have a presentation and how to uh, get people to commit to voting for the union. Uh, and we had a system, uh, they were yes, they were maybe yes, they were no, uh, maybe no, or undecided. And we had to put in there every day what we rated those people. And Fred would say, why do you rate them that way? Well, I, I, I feel that, he said, no, 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 you can't feel. <laughs> you have to actually hear them say it and be sure that they mean it. And so he was training us every day. So we do that. We stay sometimes like three hours going through this whole exercise, each one of them. And, and you know, when you were being asked, other people were listening and learning from what he was saying. And then when he went to the other person, somebody had a different story. So you learned that. So by the time we were through the whole 40 organizers, we had probably hit every scenario that there could ever be when you went out and talked to somebody and, and, and we were able to learn that. And we had to sort of learn from that so then put it in place the next day. So we were every day and every day. In the meantime, his file card that had started with, uh, I think it was like at that time, it was like 700 names. They had started with total unknowns then originally became uh, the whole goal is to the, have the yes pile grow every day so that we start moving them and at the end we would know what happened. So I went through and I learned the discipline, like every other one of the organizers, the discipline and the art of organizing and how to uh, talk to people about what mattered to them, not what we thought mattered to us, but what mattered to them and be able to then talk through with them how the union and, being a, and their vote uh, mattered on whether what they wanted to happen to have it be, happen. So we sp spent all of day and then at, at the end of the day when we finally got to election day, uh, we had gone through those cards like two, three, four times and then Fred says, what we're going to do for election day, you don't ask people where they're going to go vote. We're going to pick them up and take them to vote because that way we make sure that they actually go and that they vote. And so uh, election day, 
that uh, whole place was like a beehive of activity. Uh, there were people coming with cars. They were given cars to go pick somebody up. And everybody that we had talked to, we had always said, so we'll pick you up at 2.30. We'll pick you up at 10 a.m. We'll pick you up at 11 a.m. We'll pick you up at this time. And, and people, volunteers from California, came in with their cars to help go pick people up and deliver them to the polls and come back and report, okay, here's the card back. This person's voted so that you could cross them off of the list of people who had actually voted. And so it was this huge beehive of activity. And again, I was learning about how to count and I was learning about how to make sure that you got out the boat, how you delivered it, and then that you left nothing to chance. You picked them up, and if they weren't there, you went back and back and back and back until you actually got them to go uh, vote. And then at the same time, I remember that the TV was all over this. And I remember watching later that day uh, uh, they had gone to interview the Teamsters who we were running against. The head organizer was in his office and hardly anybody was busy in their office and the man was sitting at his desk and with a, a pen, a pencil going, it's in the bag, we're gonna win. And I contrasted that with what was going on under Fred Ross's leadership, what we were doing what, we, what was going on and the activity and the Teamsters that took it for granted. And I learned that you never think things for granted because when you do, that's where you're gonna wind up being surprised. And sure enough, that, that, that night uh, when the ballots were counted, we were all gathered in the Filipino hall. There were gonna be two elections, the packing shed and the field workers. And Caesar got up and he was gonna uh, report the results. And th those of us, the organizers, were sitting there like nervous, scared. What if we lose? What could I have done more? What if people were lying to me when they said that? And, I, and, and all the scenarios running through our minds and then Caesar gets up there and he announces, We're going to, we just got the results from the election. And then he said, first the, the packing shed. He says, Teamsters, I think the vote had been like 58 for the Teamsters and about 38 for the, uh, the at that time, the NFWA and the AWOC had merged to form mm -hmm. the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, mm -hmm. UFWAC which we all thought was the funniest thing, <laughs> the, the name. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he announced 38, and our heart, my heart sank to my knees. Oh my God. And then he announced the vote for, for the, the field, and he first announced the Teamsters vote. I think it was something like 328 for them. And I thought, oh my God. And then he paused. And then he said, and for the U uh, UFWAC, 530 votes. And for a minute, not a sound, nothing. Then it's sort of like, at the same time, all of us internalized what he had said, and this sheer erupted. Everybody went crazy, and then people were crying, and then and, and hugging, and and all of that. And that was of all the elections I ever did in my life, that was the most special one. It was my first one, but it's also one that was like redemption mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Is that what we believed, what we felt, and what we hoped? all came together and said that, yeah, it, it, it was possible, that you could actually see us winning uh, uh, this stuff because we had taken on the most powerful people around, including the Teamsters, 
And I particularly had a, a feeling for that because during the election campaign, uh, my partner and I, my, the organizing partner, got jumped by about 30 Teamsters. And, and when we were out announcing a, a rally, and uh, we almost got beaten up uh, because uh, they tried to pull us out of our car, and, and uh, I got a nasty gash in my mouth and a couple of punches that were thrown at us before we managed to get away. So for me, it was also a sense of, you know, we didn't fight back, we we're nonviolent, but by God, at the end, we won. And anyway, so it was a very special win. Uh, and that's how my, the lessons of that I carried for the rest of my life, I learned there. Is that, is that the only one that you were that you were an organizer because there was a second election for the journal later on not in I think in, with Jamara for Jamara I'm sorry later on um, no by then I was in the bo I was sent out to Chicago on the boycott so and that's your next step so, yeah I so didn't I didn't get participate in any other elections until the NLA, NL, uh, the ALRA passed in 1975. Uh, but I remember those lessons because really the lessons of organizing are pretty much the same, you know. It's, mm -hmm. You gotta have a plan, you gotta work your plan, and leave nothing to chance. And if you work hard and you have a, a, you stick to your system and what you know, uh, you'll get the outcome you want. And if you don't, you will know before it happens that something is wrong. You won't have to. Be, the, you won't be. The whole point is not to be surprised. If you're going to win, you know you're going to win. And you, and in all the elections I ran subsequently, I was usually within two or three votes off on what I thought the margin would be. Because I took the lessons of making sure check, recheck, and make sure that you know and hear what people are telling you, not what you want to hear, but what they are saying. And, and those were all from, from that one election. Do you remember any of the other organizers for that election? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pete Cardenas, Manuel Uranday, Robert Bustos, Marcos Munoz. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, think, I, think, uh, I think Maria must have been part of that team. Alice Tapia, Ruth Trujillo, uh, were the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. Uh, so it was pretty much even in terms of gender makeup? I think it was most, uh, primarily men, but uh, we also had a, a, a lot of women were a part of that group as well. And, uh, uh, and you know, the way it was in the Georgia at the time, they had a, a men's camp and a women's camp. And so uh, we were, uh, where the, the women organizers would do a lot of uh, making sure because they were able to get into the women's camp and talk to them. But it wasn't that they only did uh, work with women, they worked with everybody because uh, we had a bunch of tough women, I'll tell you what, and, and great organizers too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that came up in our my earlier work um, that I don't think has been documented as fully as it should be uh, about how tough the women were and the kind of leadership and uh, especially out on the picket lines and stuff that they exhibited you <laughs> can you say that out loud <laughs> you seem to be agreeing I tell you what, uh, we learned, you know, and you know, in our culture, you know, uh, men were always supposed to be the warriors, mm -hmm. and 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 women were supposed to be the ones that took care of the family and so forth. But man, I tell you what. Those women, when they're on the picket line and, and in organizing, were fearless, fearless, and some of the best organizers ever. 
you know, that because uh, for them, they never let their ego get in the way of the work. They were about the work and the outcome. And, and they were focused like nobody's business. I mean, I tell you, uh, I learned that lesson early on from, from, from the UFW. And uh, the, some of the best leaders the UFW ever had were women. And uh, the same thing in Coachella. Wherever we went, women were always the, the first ones, and they were the toughest. And, uh, and hadn't been for them, I'm not sure the UFW ever would have gotten as far as it did. I mean, in the boycott, most of the uh, women leaders were outstanding. Uh, and so we had a, the UFW was uh, gifted in, in terms of uh, uncovering everybody's potential to, as an organizer. And uh, the Saludados were a perfect example of that. Which is your next chapter, right? You're going to Chicago <laughs> after yeah, that? Before we, before that? Before we do, um, you've mentioned some people um, that were instrumental in the very early days of organizing or putting together the association well before it became a union. And in, certainly in popular culture, uh, if you listen to docs that show up or the news or, you know, holiday celebrations. It's always Cesar and Dolores that started the union. And I know that not, <coughs> not to be true, <laughs> but do you, can you talk about the other people that were there a little bit to give them their due? Uh, yeah, well, like uh, Julio and um, well, Gilbert Padilla. Well, you know, I know uh, Caesar was as always viewed as, as the founder, and he really was. Yes. But no founder by themselves can found anything. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 an organization is made up of very many people. And uh, Julio, you know, did a tremendous amount of work uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, both for founding the, the creating the foundation of the CSO in Corcoran that later morphed into the NFWA, which then became the UFW, UFWAC, and eventually the UFW. Uh, Roger Terrones did the same thing, you know, in his own area uh, around Corcoran as well. Uh, Julio also did a lot of work in Pixley. Uh, uh, Gilbert, you know, was critical. And, and a lot of work that went on in the union, as was Dolores when she joined. But she came after some of these other people. She wasn't there at the very beginning. Uh, Tony Rendine also was a major co contributor to, you know, to the founding of the union. Richard helps, uh, Chavez helped support the union from the very beginning and supported Caesar when he was out actually doing a lot of the organizing work. So it was a whole team of people that actually founded uh, the NFWA. But then there were a whole lot of other people subsequent to that that founded the UFW, the mm -hmm. UFWOC, mm -hmm. including the Filipino workers that began as the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee and then uh, started the, the Delano Grape Strike and before that had also struck in Coachella. And they were also a very key. Without them, they might not have been uh, a UFW at the time, and they certainly should and could be, uh, should be recognized and treated as founders of the union. Larry Etleong, uh, Pete Velasco, Philip Veracruz, uh, Andy Mutan, a lot of these Filipino leaders that came in and helped uh, found the union. Uh, and then obviously each iteration of the union also had new people join in and make their contributions. So. I think that the, the UFW had many mothers and fathers, and not all of them have been recognized, but should be. And uh, I think uh, it's an omission in the history of the union not to know who these people were, because they made an incredible contribution to, 
to uh, creating an incredible movement at the time. So we left off at just after you'd won uh, elections and talked about uh, a bit about the celebration the night that the numbers came in and how Chavez let you think you lost for a minute before. <laughs> just sounds like him. And so what, ha what, what followed for you? Well, in you know, the next week or so? After that election, uh, and we got involved with uh, fighting with, uh, we were having a, I think it was, we were done with Shenley and we were done with uh, Di, Di Giorgio, I think, because we had the election. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we got involved with uh, another boycott uh, where we were boycotting uh, some of the uh, wine. And so I got sent off and went as part of a group uh, to San Francisco, to Stockton, to LA. And then uh, Gilbert Padilla was in uh, Texas uh, running the melon strike. and. Caesar sent three of us, Kathy uh, Lynch, uh, that then became Murguia mm -hmm. when she got married, mm -hmm. and Eddie Frankel. Uh, three of us got put in a car because they said that uh, they really needed help in Texas because they were having a battle with the Texas Rangers. Uh, they were trying to break the strike, and all we knew is they needed help, so they put us in a car and off we drove to Texas, to Rio Grande City. Give me a minute. Did you, did you have three days to go home and change your clothes and say hello to your family, or did you just turn around and go to Texas? You got a sign and you went immediately. You know, I had one, where, for example, during the when we were uh, uh, organizing Christian Brothers, this was uh, somewhere in the in the, mm -hmm. in the 60, uh, 66, somewhere around there. Uh, and I was in a movie theater with my girlfriend, watching a movie, and got a tap on the on the shoulder, and he said, Caesar wants to see you. So I told my girlfriend, I'll be right back. I uh, Caesar wants to talk to me. She was also in the union, so. I went and they said, well, <laughs> there's a problem with the uh, Christian Brothers, the Teamsters uh, are, are uh, going in there and trying to uh, uh, take it away from us and so we need you to go there. And I said, okay, but I don't have any clothes. Said, don't worry about it, we'll get your, your clothes yeah. and send them to you. I said, so when do I gotta go? Right now, the, the car's <laughs> over there and you gotta go. So I went from the movie theater, never went back to tell my girlfriend I was going, but they probably sent somebody to tell her because uh, she then wasn't mad at me uh, mm -hmm. later. But that, that happened all the time. Something mm -hmm. happened and you got asked and you got to go and they just said, we'll send you clothes. And uh, two days later, they, I got my clothes that got sent to me. Uh, and I spent... Uh, so similarly to Texas, they just didn't tell me how long I was going to go, and I, we just took off and went to Texas. So we stayed about, wound up staying for about like three months there, working with uh, Gilbert Padilla, who was leading uh, the campaign there. So, so you had been sleeping wherever you could find place uh, during during the strike when you were well, in, when, when I, you when you were organizing in you, Texas. No, before before Texas. Well, w when you were organizing for the strike, well, no, for I, the I, vote, I mean, strike vote. Well, in Delano, obviously, I uh, my my family lived in Delano. Yeah, so. but you weren't. You were down in Coachella, right? Okay, well, when we went in Coachella, and and when we went out on the boycott, what the union did is they they rented what we called boycott houses. Yeah where we lived collectively together. Yeah. Uh, there were anywhere from five to 20 of us could be living in a house. You know, it got so that we would joke 
that when we were living, we would all, we would all have to sleep on our side to make room for everybody. Yeah. And when you wanted to turn, you say, okay, turn left, everybody. And we would all <laughs> turn left at the same time. Because we, we slept on the floor, we slept in churches, in church ba uh, 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 halls or wherever. It, it, wherever it was, you know. Uh, and then shortly after that, you turn around and leave for Texas for the same kind of conditions, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was the same uh, everywhere we went because the union paid uh, for our room and board. That meant that they rent an apartment or they find us some place for us to stay. Sometimes we'd stay with a, a supporter, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, sleeping on the couch. Uh, and uh, for long term, things like the boycott. We rented an apartment, we all lived there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we go out and supporters would donate furniture, they would donate beds, or we went and got like uh, some of those little, uh, uh, like army beds. Army cots. You know, army cots, and, yeah. and then we uh, did those, and we went to the boycott, you know. We we had to live off the, off the land, so, mm -hmm. so we got, people who donate food and they donate clothing, they donated cars for us, they did everything. We were supposed to uh, not be a burden on, on, on the <laughs> union. We were supposed to, like for example, when I went to Chicago, my job was to raise enough money every month to pay for the apartment that we rented, to pay for everybody's $5 a week uh, allowance and $5 a week for food allowance. And and then have money left over to send back to support the Lanos up the the whole the national operation. Mm -hmm. So, well, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow, but I just wanted to hear you talk about sort of your living conditions, your lack of rest. You're never knowing where you're going to be, <laughs> uh, but always willing to go. Yeah. Uh, and so you were getting ready to talk about going down to Texas with Gilbert in the melon strike. And I know that was tough because you were being confronted by the Texas Rangers there. So could you yeah. give us some detail on that? Well, when we went there, you know, the one of the things that, that we found, you know, the Texas Rangers have a history mm -hmm. yeah, of, of, a, of a just abuse. And, and mistreatment and, and outright violence against particularly Latinos in South mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. So when we went there, we did, I didn't know who the mm -hmm. Texas Ranger, I knew by reputation. Uh, but one of the things that then that I found is that UFW was always very creative in its strategies. So one of the things that uh, for the union to be able to deal with is they found out what hotel the Rangers would stay in and they organized uh, a vigil of nothing but women dressed in black and uh, with uh, their mantillas yeah, covering their, their head and then praying. And they would parade in front of the hotel praying for the rangers to see the justice of our cause and stop what they were doing. And the contrast between the rangers and their guns and, and their Stetsons and all of that their boots and the reputation and there's women who were just praying for them to seize their attacks on farm workers that all they wanted to do was to have a better life was an appeal to the public so that it would become untenable for them as, as uh, public officials to be helping the growers break the strike and that went on for weeks, and uh, I think finally the Rangers did wind up leaving, but by then they had broken the strike, and, uh, and at the end it was just, a, we had about like 200 people that were still hanging on, but for all intents and purposes the strike had been broken, and it was just uh, people hanging on, you know, f uh, out of the belief that they were doing something, but it, uh, it became very clear that the strike had failed, and uh, so we returned back to California uh, about, after about three months or so, because uh, both between the arrests 
that were made of strikers on any violation and then you had to post bail for them. It was bleeding the union dry and then the recruitment of strike breakers, uh, the growers recruitment of strike breakers was ongoing. So, uh, so we lost that strike uh, and- In a vote? No, there was no vote. There was never a vote. No vote. They, they, the strike was uh, was lost, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, and in Texas, it's a hard place to organize. Mm -hmm. A very hard place, uh, because even more so than what Delano was, the power structure there mm -hmm. was completely arrayed against uh, uh, workers when they try to organize. And so when I return, when we returned back to California. They were just beginning, a, this was around mm, June, late June of 1967. They were beginning to organize the Jimara Grape Company, which was the largest mm -hmm. table grape company in the world at the time. And I was put on as an organizer to go out and start meeting with workers, which I did. And then two weeks later, there was gonna be a big rally uh, in Bakersfield of Jamara workers, and they asked me to be the MC, uh, and I'd never done anything like that, but I guess they thought that I was dumb enough to do anything I got assigned, so <laughs> they asked me to do that, and I guess I did a good job because about two days later, uh, I got called again that uh, they wanted, Caesar wanted to talk to me. So I went in and, and saw him, and he was in a strategy meeting with people. Uh, his his uh, uh, his staff, his executive staff, and then he said, "Well, you know, we'd like you to go to Chicago on the boycott." And I said, "So when do you need me to go?" And he says, "Right away." And said, "Well, how how long am I going to be gone?" He said, oh, "About two weeks." I said, "Well, how am I going to get there?" "Oh, we'll get you on a plane ticket." And I'd never been on a plane before. Uh, this was totally new to me. I didn't know where Chicago was, and I thought I was going for two weeks. So, so they gave me a bag of buttons, and they said, here, you can sell these to supporters to get some money. And they gave me $20 and the name of one person. And I said, okay. So I, I get on the airplane. <laughs> I'm flying to Chicago. I get to Chicago, and uh, find my way out out of the airport. This is the first time I've ever flown, first time I've ever been, and I had no idea how big Chicago was. I didn't know nothing about Chicago. And then there's uh, this guy waiting for me, uh, takes me home, puts me up at his house. He was a, the volunteer chair of the Chicago Boycott Committee. Uh, John Armendariz was his name. He was a postal worker. So I said, so what are we doing? He says, well, we can't, I can't pick it because of the Hatch Act, which is supposed to mean federal employees mm -hmm. are not supposed to get involved in mm -hmm. political activities. So I said, okay, but I'm, I don't work for the government, so I can do that. But I had no idea how to do a boycott of grapes. My previous experience was <laughs> that uh, there would be 40 of us that would go to a, together to a city, and then we would dispatch teams out to picket stores, you know, for how long, to, to convince them to take the grapes or the wine or whatever off the shelves. Mm -hmm. Here I was by myself and, uh, and, and no clue how to stop the sale of grapes, so that's what I was asked to do. So I, I looked in the yellow pages, there was yellow pages then, and I looked to see where there were stores and there were a bunch of stores listed. I saw one that said AMP. Yeah. Oh, I, dialed the phone and called the AMP and asked to speak to whoever was in charge. And they must have thought I was not. I said, because I'm a farm worker, I just got here from Delano and I wanted to talk to him about stopping the sale of grapes. Uh, I have no clue, what, I don't remember what they told me, but they must have thought I was totally crazy. <laughs> because, and I had no idea who I talked to. It could have been the janitor for all I know. Uh, and after I made a couple of those calls, it didn't seem like that was working out. <laughs> I, was, I was very frustrated. I didn't know what to do. I, I had rented a house on 18th Street, which is the Mex or historic Mexican community of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And for several days, I just got, I was 
totally depressed. I, I didn't even want to get out of bed because I didn't know what to do. And I felt horrible that I was letting people down because I wasn't stopping the sale of grapes and I had no idea how to do it. Uh, but eventually, after a couple of days, I picked myself up and then I said, well, I'm going to go talk to anybody that'll listen to me. So I went back to the Yellow Page and started finding out unions. And I started calling them and see if I could come by and see them. And so I went there, and uh, the first ones that I saw was the United Packing House Workers Union, which was headquartered in Chicago. And I went in there, and I talked to uh, two people. One of them was Paul Booth, who had been the chair of the Students for, uh, for a Democratic Society and had ended that part of, of his life, you know, and, uh, and gone on to work in the research department of the Packing House Workers Union. The other one was a guy named, uh, the director, his name was Kerry Napek. And so they listened to me and they said, okay, we'll help you and, and here we will do. And, and Kerry says, well, you know what? Uh, there's a, a convention coming up of the, of the Illinois State AFL-CIO. Why don't you come up with us and we'll see if we can get you in to speak to all of the delegates. I thought, oh, okay, that, that'd be good. Uh, and so I went to this convention and they did get me a slot to speak. I was nervous, like, oh, get out. I wasn't used to going out and speaking to this. And there was like 2,000 delegates, to play, you know, and I was scared to death. So Kerry then, before I speak, he takes me in and to the bar. I had just turned 21. I was, it was 1967, I was just 21 and a half years old. And so he bought me two drinks, uh, a whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> that helped with the nerves. <laughs> and then and, and, uh, I got me feeling better. So I got up there and I talked to, about what I was doing there and what the farm workers were doing. And I was blown away because the response that we got, people took out, they said, let's take up a floor collection. And they started passing out packs and everybody threw in money in there. And they collected like $2,000, which in 1967, it was a, a pretty nice little haul and and I and and then that night, Kerry took me around at a dinner, and took me table by table and introduced me to the heads of the unions that were there, and I, and they all said to me, "Oh, that was a nice speech." I said, "Well, thank you, thank you, you know." And I and I said, you know, and he said, and Kerry had told me, "Ask him to, did you like to come to speak at their membership meeting?" So I would ask all of them. And they all oh, sure, so they gave me their name and their business card and when their union meeting, I said, call me and then we'll schedule you. So I, they took me around and I got all this stack of business cards and, and union meeting. And when I got back, I started calling them back and then they all invited me to come to their union meetings. And I had no idea how big they were or how many people came. And I went and, and I, started speaking to a, a whole lot of them, and I got some great reception. Those union members, you know, I went and spoke at the steel workers and auto workers and bakery workers and, and, and service workers, and, and they all were very, very supportive, and they all passed resolutions at their meetings and support the great boycott. And, and I said, well, this is working out pretty good. Then I, then I said, well, maybe I'll ask them for money too, since they gave me money at the last one. And I started asking for money, and they would give me money uh, for the union. And then I said, okay. So I said, well, maybe then I'll go to churches. And, and, and I started asking churches if they would let me come and talk to the pastor. And I said, you know, this is what we're doing, and we need some help. And uh, could I come and, and speak at, uh, at your services? Or could I come and pass out leaflets with, at the end of your services? And they sure, come on and, and do that. And and and. And then, uh, I, uh, then one of uh, the people that I met says, you know, we should pick up the stores. And I didn't have anybody except myself, so I started, uh, we started asking people to come out and help us pick it. So every Saturday, we started having picket lines at different stores. Uh, and then I said, oh, 
maybe the churches, and maybe I'll go to the schools. So I started going to schools and uh, to high schools and colleges, and I would go to classes. Professors would let me come and, and, and talk during their classes. And at every one, I would tell people, you know, we're poor people, we don't have any money. So if you got any money burning holes in your pockets, you know, uh, it'll go to support those people who are on strike. It's not gonna go to somebody's big salary. All I get is $5 a week, and, but uh, people need help in order to do it. And so kids started giving us their lunch money and then and unions would give us money. And we started raising like on a regular basis, like $1,000 a month. And, and it was cost us about $500 to run the operation in Chicago. And then I sent the rest of it to Delano. Then they sent me people to come and help, and that's where I met the Saludado sisters. So let me ask you about what you say when you talk first to the convention and then the, the individual unions after that that convinced them that farm workers needed their help and made them willing to help you. Well, I think, I think that the unions, that many of them, particularly the union leaders, mm -hmm. that it reminded them of when they started out and the struggles that they had, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and it was something familiar to them. Mm -hmm. And they believed deeply in the, in the rights of working people. So it was like something that, made sense to them because it, it was within their experience. And they also, I thought, felt that it was unfair that farm workers who were so poor had nothing. And it was, all they were asking was not unreasonable. We were asking for a dollar and 40 cents an hour. And you said that to people, and they said, a dollar and 40 cents an hour? That's reasonable. And so I think it was like, it harkened back to their years of struggle and what they had gone through to build their unions, and then uh, it made them feel like uh, they were contributing to help somebody that was in need of, uh, of uh, uh, fellow workers. And then when I, the churches, you know, I think, you know, the whole question of poor people struggling, justice, fairness, uh, uh, you know, because particularly the Catholic churches, and I think uh, I found the same thing regardless of denomination. And I, I spoke at hundreds of Catholic churches, of Protestant churches, uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, United Church of Christ. Uh, I spoke at the synagogues. And basically, I pitched to them, this is a, a, a question of fairness. This is poor people that want nothing more and to be able to have a decent life, to be able to take care of their families, their children. It's not fair that they're uh, uh, picking and harvesting the food for everybody else, but don't have enough food for themselves and their children. That's not fair. And I think that struck a chord with them uh, because of uh, what they always said is that uh, they, they, they had uh, one of the options for the poor. And, and when I went to speak at the colleges and to the, the students and others, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, the young are very passionate. And they see things that are not right, they want to make them right. And they have yet to discover what their passion in life is going to be. And, and when they hear about something, somebody struggling, uh, they want to be a part of that. It sounds like exciting. It's something new. And, and uh, it, 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 I think it, it, it touched them. And, and, and they were willing to do more than uh, they had. And they have all the time in the world other than their classes. You know, they, they were willing to invest that time. And when I went to the black churches, and the, you know, for them it was in the height of the civil rights struggle. So they understood what we were talking about is how other people of color were trying to be treated fairly, and uh, they understood that. And you know, when I went and I talked to in the Latino community, because uh, they got it. 
It's, this is our people who have been mistreated and they're trying to get better. So I had like the, the Latino uh, uh, newspapers were all full on board and the paper El Informador and La Prensa and Chicago, they were all on it. And so it was like everybody understood what we were doing from their own experience. And, and it made sense to them uh, to do it. And, you know, and then when we went to talk to uh, public officials, you know, then they, they also understood because, uh, at least in Chicago, you know, they represented a city with working class roots. So a lot of them, that city was run by the Democrats. The Republicans were like nothing, you know. And, the first thing they said, well, let, let, let's go get, uh, introduce a resolution in the city of Chicago to have the city not buy grapes for any of its institutions. Because at the time, uh, President Nixon was increasing the purchase of grapes for federal facilities. So the city mm -hmm. said, well, we're going to stop buying grapes for ours. So a resolution was prepared, and I had no clue how the politics in Chicago worked. There was an, uh, an alderman by the name of Bill Singer and uh, uh, Leon Dupre, who were, unbeknownst to me, were uh, on the outs with the Daily, Richard Daly's administration, mm -hmm. who controlled the city. He was the mayor, yeah. and there were 50 aldermen, and there were like two of them, uh, three of them that were on the outs that were considered uh, to be opponents of the Daly administration. And they were really supportive of us, so I asked if, uh, we asked them if they would run the, the, the resolution. Well, if I had known the politics, I would have known that that was the kiss of death to have them and <laughs> do a resolution. But so w they went and they presented it to the city council, and Richard Daly sitting up there like this. And then when after they get through the presentation, everybody looked at him, and he said, passed unanimously. It was incredible. I didn't know until later, you know, that the unions had talked to Daly and said, this is a good thing that you need to do, the, regardless of my screw up and, and asking his opponents to introduce the resolution. And so then it all sort of began to snowball with a, a lot of things and over times we must have spoken to hundreds and hundreds, all of us, because Saludado sisters went out and spoke, Heriberto Yanez, who was one of the other organizers that were sent there. Everybody went, and then we started recruiting people uh, to join the boycott staff. Uh, we eventually grew up to about 10 or 12 people that were working full time. And we all made $5 a week, and we all lived collectively, so it was cheap operation. But we just, uh, and then we started getting uh, priests that supported us. So we came up with strategies like doing pray-ins. So we would go inside the, the chain stores and then we would kneel in front of the protestants where the grapes were and the priest would start praying for the store to do the right thing and not carry grapes and all of the, the clients are going, what, what's going on here? Why, 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 what's going? So we just did everything that we could think of to put pr public pressure on, on, on these stores. And for them, grapes was a, a margin, a very small margin of profit. It wasn't that big of an item for them. And we became so much of a problem for them. Bad publicity, uh, disruption because their managers had to deal with all this pre-spraying in front of the grapes and this ladies coming up and complaining to them and, and the unions uh, complaining about them. It just became a big problem. So, uh, and the same thing happened all over the country. And then finally, uh, the chain decided, why are we having this battle for these guys in California? We're gonna get ourselves out of it. We're gonna stop selling grapes. And Chicago announced that, Boston announced that, New York, and a number of other the big cities, and then it snowballed from there. And then the bishops committee got involved and brought the growers to the table. And I remember one night when I got back from having a, making a presentation in Gary, Indiana, to a group, 
I get back to the apartment, and at that time, you know, you, there's no such a thing as cell phones. <laughs> you were, when you left, you were out of pocket. So I get back, and Bill Chandler, who was working with me, sort of uh, says, Caesar's been trying to reach you. I said, oh. So I call Caesar back, and I get him on the phone, and he says, hi, you know, we, I said, you've been trying to reach me? He says, yeah. We just want, uh, want to tell you that we just had a meeting with the growers in Delano. I said, really? Yeah, and I said, so who was there? So he starts reading me the list of the growers in Delano. Long list. And I said, was Den Two Door there? That's a company I used to work for. He said, yeah, they were there. And they all signed a contract. The boycott's over. And after three years of, in Chicago, after I had been told I was going to be there two weeks, <laughs> I was there three years. But to have heard that we had won the grape strike, that every grower had signed, and was an incredible feeling. I thought that the New Georgia election was a great feeling when they announced it. Nothing compared to hearing that we had won that grape strike because it meant that it wasn't one company, but all the grape growers had signed the uh, union contract and recognized us because for us, for me, it meant not that we had won a dollar and 40 cents or whatever the rate uh, that we settled on, I don't even remember. But it meant to me that we had been recognized as human beings, that we were gonna be given the respect we deserved and that we were no longer invisible. It was just an incredible feeling, and I tell you, you know, that for me, you know, it, those years in Chicago and those freezing days in which we had to walk picket lines in front of the chain stores was all worth it. It was just the greatest feeling, and that little group of us uh, went out and blew our five dollars on going out and buying food and beer so that we could celebrate and uh, <laughs> was the greatest feeling in the world. I have a couple questions or cl clarifications and one is going to sound like it's out of left field but first you went there by yourself but when did the other UFW people arrive from Delano? What, how long were you by yourself? Well, I think that uh, when I first went, uh, I think maybe about three to four months, something like that, mm -hmm. maybe five months, uh, people were sent to, to join me. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were different people that came at different times, like for example, during the, the, that farm workers themselves came up. The biggest group came up after the, uh, uh, I think, I think it was after the uh, the 1973 uh, grape strike. A whole bunch of people were sent out, and they came, and we had like 40 or 50 people, but uh, that were in Chicago. But in most times, it probably was more around like eight or ten of us that were working full time, and then around us, we had a boycott committee that was uh, made up of a another 50 to 60 people, and then volunteers that would come out and help pick it, we had like another three to 400. So, and then we had, of course, a lot of other people that supported us, like we had volunteer lawyers that represented us. Uh, we had union leaders that actually then uh, 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 gave us money on a regular basis and, and bought for example, in the winter, they bought clothes for us. So, so w I would say that uh, overall, between uh, at any given time, our boycott operation must have been around three to four thousand people that were uh, involved in in one way or the other uh, with supporting. Yeah, I'm interested because I've talked to them uh, uh, when the Solidado sisters, and I think there were five of them. That came at one time? Well, two of them that were involved where I was, uh, Antoni yeah. Antonia and Maria. 
Yes. Antonia came and, and was there for a while, you know, and then she left. I think she went to, if I'm not mistaken, to Toronto, but I may be wrong on that. And Maria stayed uh, uh, until the, the, the grape strike ended. But after she came, then she also came back when we did the, the lettuce boycott. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wa uh, I sent her off to do the boycott in Indianapolis by herself. And she did a really great job. Uh, so all together, I guess Maria and I must have worked together for a couple of years at least. And Antonio was one of the gripping parts of her story was about being at the Central Market where the grapes came in mm -hmm. when they first got there. And she, like you, had no idea what Chicago was and or the weather or anything. She had a light sweater and she said that uh, some woman, a church woman, walked in one day while they were picketing there. And so what are you, <laughs> where, where are your coats? What are you doing here? And the next day came back with coats for everybody and stuff like that. But you know, the, uh, encountering that cold that Chicago was Chicago weather, and I'm sure the wind was really whistling. And I grew up just a hundred miles south of Chicago, so I'm well acquainted with those winters. And so they must have arrived shortly before winter. Mm -hmm. now, maybe that was your first. Yeah, year. we we all got there. Uh, uh, I I know I got there in the summer. Mm -hmm. And they must have gotten there in the, uh, the towards the tail end of summer, mm -hmm. early autumn. Yeah. None of us were warned how cold it was. Of course, even if we had been warned, we had no warm clothes right. for Chicago in in in, in Delano. You know, it, it yeah. gets cold, but a light jacket is yeah. is all we we ever wore. And uh, and people gave us clothes. Mm -hmm. Some unions I remember bought clothes for us, as, uh, coats for us, because it was so cold. And, and you know, and, and the, Baker's un the Baker's Union, for example, gave us bread. And the Meat Cutters Union gave us big things of, of uh, a bologna, you know, big sausage-like mm -hmm. things. But all of those things uh, were taken care of us. But the worst part was, the, was winter. You know, that wind coming off the lake mm -hmm. after a snowstorm turning everything into ice and then it's like you were living inside a freezer. It was horrible. Uh, but it's what we dealt with, you know. None of us ever thought about leaving and coming back because we were committed to doing it. And, uh, and Maria and, and Antonia, boy, they hardcore. They, they were not going to give up until we won. And at least Antonia was still a teenager, wasn't she? She and must have 17, been. 17, 18 years old. Yeah, I was around there. Yeah. Maria, I know Maria was around 24, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And Antonia was, yeah, it's a teenager, you know. And it was interesting that they were allowed to go because their parents were very strict. Yeah. And and their dad was not letting their two daughters go off into with some guys up in on the boycott, you know. It, yeah. It was hard for him to let them go, but she they told me that their father had worked here and was in working in steel and was a member of the Steelworkers Union and had a really good job in Los Angeles at the, at the steel processing plant. I was wondering if you were going to say it too. And they said he'd come home, you know, once a year. And nine months later, there'd be a new kid at the house, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and finally, her mother said, all right, that's enough. I can't keep just raising all of your children for you down here by myself. So we're going to go there. And he was so strict about his daughters, but he said, you can't 
we can't raise girls in Los Angeles. It's not, not a city where you can give kids, especially girls, a good life. And his brother was in Delano, so he gave up his union job in Los Angeles and moved to Delano with, there was probably four or five of them by then, you know. Uh, they were a big family. Yeah. But, but boy, their, their, their parents were also real solid union uh, uh, members and, yeah. and, you know, and it was, uh, it was hard, you know. I think once again, it was the two older girls that convinced them to join the union. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but you know, you have to, to to appreciate with them is not only joining the union and all of that, but also breaking out of a culture. Yes, where women were not supposed to do that and then leave home and and go off on their own like that. So it it was really one some of the difficult choices that people had to make personally, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that uh, for the union. Uh, and I think all of us, you know, benefited and, and, and became much, much stronger uh, for the experience, not only on our skills as, as organizers that we learned, but also as human beings being able to exercise our own power and our own uh, decisions and determination, you know, to and breaking out of a mold that we were in, you know, was hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard, and but you know what? I think if you asked any of us, with all the stuff that we went through, we would all say we would do it all over again in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So, this is another sort of offhand question. It's you talked about the groceries in Chicago said, at some point said, we're not making enough money off these grapes to put up with this stuff. So let's just get out of the grape business. And it reminded me of that, that Shinley was the first contract, right? Yes. And of course, Shinley was a huge corporation and they had lots of union workers for them, so they weren't afraid of unions. But there's a story that I'd like to know if it's true or not, that Gilbert Padilla was working in Los Angeles and he got to be friends with a bartender down there, down here. <laughs> Oh, Blackie Levitt? Blackie Levitt, and Blackie Levitt convinced his brothers in the union to quit pouring Shinley liquor. That they were going to refuse to, they, apparently they never did, but, and maybe it wasn't even a real threat, but it circulated, and it got back to Shinley, and they said, <laughs> you know, we're not going to give up that all the liquor that we pour in Los Angeles to stay, I mean, we'll be better off to sign with the union. And that's, that, they signed during the march on, in 66, did they not? Mm -hmm. The Cesar and Dolores maybe left the, or Gilbert left the march and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, went that's to meet their lawyer and got a, tentative agreement to sign? Yeah, I think it was uh, during the march that they, uh, I know Caesar left the march at some point and I wasn't at the march because uh, at that time I was working at, at the nursery, mm -hmm. but I heard later that he had left during the meeting and flew to LA uh, where they worked out the deal and they were able to announce it when they during the march when at some point. When they got to Sacramento, yeah. they announced yeah. yeah, and I know that that uh, Blackie was very instrumental in making making the deal come about because he so was there, the one. So there, there, the there's connection, a lot yeah. of truth to that story. Yeah. Yeah. But somebody I re read yeah. recently said, yeah. oh, that was just a myth. But no, no, he, he was pretty instrumental in making that happen. And see, and I think that one of the things that 
that in the UFW, one was able to create the conditions that allowed for an intervention mm -hmm. that, that made the deals possible. Was the union making life miserable, you know, for Shenley, and then somebody was like Blackie was able to come and help put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, the great boycott making life miserable for the, the, the growers, and then the bishops' committee then coming in and help broker the deal. Uh, you know, uh, Jerry Brown in a number of, of places, you know, also played a very critical role, uh, mm -hmm. none more important than his uh, bringing about the, uh, the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. Mm -hmm. So it was the genius of, of what Caesar did is that it created that environment that made it possible for other people who, who cared about what was going on with the farm workers, and it made it possible for them to contribute to breakthroughs, uh, either by uh, brokering deals or, or, or making things possible, like Jerry uh, having his gubernatorial authority, but also delivering the legislature to pass the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. You know, it was all it's extremely critical, and then obviously. Latino legislators, Richard Alatorre and uh, and um, and Art Torres, Art Torres, who were the, the the two sponsors of the legislation, and they helped to bring the legislature along because at the time, mm -hmm. you know, it's Latinos were becoming much more important in the political process. So all of these things, Caesar was able to strategize and 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 and. And, and make possible, you know, the... So it must have been particularly gall galling for you and all the other farm workers that farm workers were left out of the protections that were given to all the other workers. And did that keep coming up in your meetings? And Yeah. Well, and, and when we, we always said, you know, uh, when we went out, we're, in the boycott, it was one of the things says we've been excluded from everything. Mm -hmm. No unemployment insurance, no workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, National Labor Relations Act doesn't recognize us, doesn't give us the rights that other workers have. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was part, it wasn't, uh, when we explained it wasn't part of, of our complaint or, or, or it was part of a, a story that needed that of injustice that needed to be set right, and that people had the power to do it. And we said to the particularly, you know, in the cities, to the bo and the boycott to the consumers, he said, "You have a tremendous amount of power to change the conditions under which farm workers live by doing a very simple act. Just don't eat grapes, don't buy lettuce, and." Very small sacrifice that led to some huge changes uh, in, in society. And, and the one thing that I learned, I think, from all those years is that there's a fundamental goodness in the American people who have a values of fair play, that people ought to be treated fairly, and given an opportunity, you know, they will uh, act on behalf of those workers to bring about change. I saw it later on in my life with the home care workers, with the janitors, with uh, all these other workers that, uh, they're not farm workers, but they were in the same situation and the same conditions. Yes. And they appealed based on the experiences with the, of the UFW. They engaged in public uh, appeals to, uh, to, the, to the community and, and they were able to win with public pressure. You know, uh, so those were all the lessons of the UFW that continue giving. You know, if immigrants are doing the same things today. You know, if you look at the uh, at the uh, Dreamers, mm -hmm. you know their public message about fairness and the American dream and all of that, and the public reaction that uh, that, that they get consistently from the majority of the American people. You know, and and that's been historically true. The same thing happened with the support for the civil rights movement. You know. So we'll get back to your 
ongoing there. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not No, I, what, I was interested in all those things, and I, I'm the guy that took you off your stride. But so you came back from Chicago. You remember what year that was? 1970. And that was at the beginning of the lettuce strike, right? Yeah, when 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 the boycott ended, uh, shortly thereafter, I think that what uh, this is what I think happened, not that I know happened, but that I think happened, is that we scared the BGs out of the the lettuce growers in the Salinas area when mm -hmm. when the boycott won. So they feared that they were going to. Uh, go out and, and sign up a contract with the Teamsters to sort of forestall any union organizing mm -hmm. because then they would have a union contract and they would uh, it would do it. But when the uni when the UFW found out about it, Caesar and everybody mobilized to Salinas because some co uh, lettuce company workers had gone out on strike to protest the sweetheart deal that was being cooked up with the Teamsters. So the, the union moved there, didn't even have time to, to figure out how to administer the contracts in Delano, how to do anything, moved all of its best people up to Salinas. Boycott ended and we were directed to all report to Salina, Salinas rather than go back to our homes. Me, I was hoping that when it ended, <laughs> my goal was I wanted to come back to Delano and learn how to administer the contracts and help build on what we had won. Mm -hmm. But I was instead, I was told to report to Salinas. And, uh, and truth be told, that was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. Thousands of workers walking out and were solid for the union. I mean, it, I've never seen anything like that, not even in Delano, because uh, at our height, when the, we had 1,000 uh, people at that uh, meeting, and we had people that uh, joined us in marches, but there, these people all went out on strike. And so I was there for about uh, three weeks, uh, long enough to be able to see, and then I get called by Caesar, and I said, he said, like he always did, says, well, you know, we got this strike. Uh, we don't think we're gonna win. We're gonna need to start up a latest boycott again, and we need you to go back to Chicago. I said, I don't want to. I wanted to go to Delano. He said, well, it's up to you, but uh, this is what's going on, and you don't have to, but think about it. So then I, I, I got to go home for about uh, to Delano uh, for a couple of days, and I started thinking. I said, you know, if I'm going to work for the union, it's not what I want. It's what it needs me to do. And and if this is the most important thing that needs to happen, then it doesn't matter what I want, it's what I need to do. So I called him back and I said, okay, I'll go back to Chicago. So then I drove back to Salinas. There was a whole, we had a whole day in which people were able to interview all of the other org the boycotters that have been around and all of the people that have been asked to go back on the boycott and were the bo going to be the boycott directors. I was going to be the boycott director for Chicago again. And I went around and interviewed people uh, to see if they wanted to go to Chicago with me and see if I what I thought about them. So then I picked my team and other people picked their teams and we got on cars and headed back to Chicago. Other people headed to New York, others to Canada, or others to Denver, others to Boston, and we scattered all over the country to start out the, the latest boycott. And back to Chicago. And you just, I can't believe you could, could I take a heavy coat with me this time? Um, you you did you rely on your old contacts and stuff when you got there then in Chicago? Yeah, I knew yeah. everybody from having yeah. spent three years, so I basically went up and now I had to go and and explain to them. So uh, here we are again. <laughs> but it was more complicated than it had been uh, with the grapes 
because grapes was a luxury item, you yeah. know. But lettuce was much more of a staple in people's diet, mm -hmm. so it was more difficult. And then we had the additional uh, confusion with the Teamsters being involved. Because then they started saying, oh no, this isn't about poor farm workers needing their own union. This is about a fight between two unions. They have a jurisdictional issue mm -hmm. and, uh, and who's right and who's wrong. You know, it's messy, you don't want to get involved. And, and so the growers were using that to their big advantage with the help of the Teamsters. And that also meant that the union support was much more divided because of that. So it was a much, much more complicated process of doing the lettuce boycott than it had been with the grapes. And it called for a lot. The same strategy in terms of pressuring stores and all of that and gaining public support, but it took a lot more explaining and uh, to be able to get people to understand why they needed to continue supporting uh, uh, the farm workers. So the, the Teamsters, of course, were already big in Chicago, right? And they had a lot of union members that were loyal to them, right? Mm -hmm. So they organized against you in, in, on a local level, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they uh, you know, they, they uh, uh, had Teamsters go out and, 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 and also go out and, and do public meetings and talk to people about what was going on and why what we were doing was, uh, was not right because uh, they had, the workers were happy, they had a union contract and everything else. And then obviously there were Teamster locals in Chicago also that were no longer friendly at this point because of that. Yeah, uh, like even, the meat cutters that were helping you out and, before, they were probably And the teamsters. meat cutters were very close allies of the Teamsters, so yeah. that it created a problem. Um, so it became, and then, so, so that went on and continued to, to be an issue uh, on, uh, that needed to, to be fought and, uh, and dealt with. So how long were you in Chicago on this? Issue. Well, I was there until 1971 when I then left uh, to come back to California. And what I had wanted to do was learn about administering union contracts and all of that. Uh, I was assigned to go to uh, Calexico, mm -hmm. to uh, which is on the Mexican border, and uh, they had. There were no grapes there, obviously. They were all vegetable uh, companies. They were sort of like the winner, uh, mirror image of Salinas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I went to, to Calexico uh, to uh, run the, the, the union there, and I spent a year doing that, and I loved it. So it you, you stepped right into all the issues with the hiring halls. The hiring and, hall, yeah. And the seniority of people that weren't in the unions and all of that stuff. All that of that stuff. You had to straighten out. Yeah, and it, it actually, it, the, it, the union, you know, was very strong about making that uh, rather than employer seniority, use union seniority was a big issue. And then also the hiring call. Mm -hmm. uh, but to Caesar's credit, he gave me enough freedom to figure out how I could fix all of those problems. So one of the things that, I've, uh, that I figure out pretty quickly is why are we getting involved with dispatching all of the people that are regular employees of the company? They just go from one location to the other, the same crews every year. So instead, I set up a system where instead of them all having to come in, that they could uh, uh, have their, the, the union steward come in and with a list of their crews and who they were, and then we gave them, they were all clear to go to work, uh, just like that, and it, it avoided that. Similarly, the company had a list of the, there was a crews of the regular crews that worked in the, in the Calexico every year. Mm -hmm. Then we didn't bother with having to dispatch them, so it took a lot of work away from us, and it also a lot of the tension. Instead, 
the ones that we dispatched under the hiring hall was the, for new workers that were new to the company. And it was much more efficient. It worked that way much, much better. And uh, then in, in negotiations with the companies, we figured out uh, the seniority issue, which uh, we did it on the basis of, uh, of uh, who was there at the, at the, at the company uh, and, and their length of service. So they were difficult issues, but not impossible to fix. You know, you just needed to apply some common sense to it and then work uh, with the, the union stewards and the company to make it a, a system that worked. It, it, is this a period where the issue of not having locals begin to pop up? Well, it, People. Not, not at the time, but uh, over time it became an issue, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, with uh, particularly, well, it, there was a difference between companies where, wh whose workers migrated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all over the state, those having a, 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 a system where one union that work well because they were migrants. It was different in a place like Delano where people were pretty much year-round employees. Sure. Where a, a local union would have worked much better for them because then you could have dealt with all of their issues locally. Uh, and, and so, however, the way the union was structured made it very difficult to be able to adjust based on local conditions and I think that was one of the drawbacks of, uh, of having just one national union with no locals. And what turns out is that then basically having a national uh, union is that you had national staff that were in charge of doing all of these things, but we were subject to being transferred to go to work somewhere else. And it didn't provide the stability required to create uh, an efficient organization for the long term, mm -hmm. and and I think that was one of the things that we learned over the lo long period that that was one of the problems with the way we set the union up initially. Uh, but I had a question, but but it was right. Uh, I'm going to bring you back to Chicago because mm -hmm. we have Antonio Saludado and Maria Saludado's mm -hmm. oh history, and I was thinking you you mentioned before during the during the organizing, the advantage of having women as organizers is because they had access to uh, the women camps. What was the advantage of having Maria and Antonia and other women working with you in Chicago when, they, when you were doing the boycott? Because they were exceptional organizers. They could also sing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they could sing, but they, they, <laughs> were, they were exceptional organizers. You know, the one thing I learned is that exceptional organizers aren't defined by gender. Mm -hmm. They're defined by their passion, their skills, their ability, and their commitment. And boy, I found that women have that in, in spades. They, they were uh, tireless and they uh, were able to just, when they went, wherever they went, they were actually received much better than men were <laughs> because, you know, they, they were so genuine when they went and they talked about what they, what, why they were doing this and why it mattered to them and their mm -hmm. families and all of that. You know, I mean, ever since then uh, off of that experience, you know, is that I always learned, you know, that uh, uh, women make the best organizers and, and, and again, because I think that they come more into what the outcome is rather than the ego of, of the thing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah I know what you mean. But, uh, but did it matter, for example, in the case of the supermarkets, if they were, they were speaking to women? Did that make a difference? I think that they, uh, some of them initially uh, thought that uh, they didn't have to listen to them because mm -hmm. they were women. Mm -hmm. But they learned quickly. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
that their, their, their mistake, you know, and some of the best boycott leaders in the country were women. You know, you had Jessica Govea, who did a hell of a job in, 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 in Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had friend Ryan that was running the boycott, uh, I think it was in, in for a, a while in, in, in Pittsburgh. And no, and it was it very quickly, you know, never became an issue at all. It, uh, because at the end of the day, it was who could do the job. And, and, and I had another question about the boycott in Chicago. Mm -hmm. How did you um, share that experience? Because in, in the case of uh, the way Fred Ross organized you and put mm -hmm. you together and learned what was going on during the vote, is there, is there a similar process that you went through in the boycott where you guys were sharing in different places what was going on? Was that done in regular basis or, or yeah. it was just completely not happening? Well, no. What uh, at least uh, uh, I took it. Uh, I took it upon myself to call myself the, the Midwest boycott director, and and so I started expanding out into other states, and we then started hosting an annual conference where we would bring the boycott staff together from all the the surrounding states everywhere. Where uh, one, it was a time for all of us to be together and. And sort of see each other and 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 share war stories. But secondly, we also spent it talking about what was going on in every city, what we were doing, what strategies we were pursuing, what was working, what wasn't working, and so we did a lot of sharing on that. Uh, and then uh, we used to host, you know, uh, uh, phone conferences as well, in which the boycott directors would get on. So we tried to coordinate that, but but uh, but the, the whole boycott was very decentralized. It began with a centralized operation that very quickly decentralized, and every boycott uh, director was pretty much free to experiment and figure out what worked best in their cities. Uh, but I think that because of the constant communication we do we learn from each other on, on, on how to do things. And I heard somebody was doing something in another city. I tried it and, and with a different twist somewhere. And because that was the one thing that I really appreciated about the whole boycott operation is that uh, Caesar had created a nurturing environment that, that encouraged innovation and independent thinking mm -hmm. and creativity. So we all were constantly trying to figure out what to do uh, differently, you know, uh, where a, a Boston had a, a tea party, a, a kind of event that got a lot. You know, I, in Chicago, we used to have our pray-ins and, uh, and others. Other cities had fasts. You know, whatever worked is what, what was tried. Depending on the, lo on the local conditions as well, right? right? Uh -huh. It makes, and it makes a sense. And, it, and, and I think that the one thing is because the, the we learned in organizing, you can't be so rigid in your approach that you don't adjust to the, to the, to the situation that you're facing. And it was different to run a boycott in a place like Toronto uh, than Chicago. Uh, it was different in St. Louis, which was a more cons conservative city mm -hmm. than, uh, than Boston. And so you had to then figure out what, what is go what's going to work best in, in your area and then work on it. And, and even, but having said that, I think to a large degree, we had some very common things that all of us did. One was the uh, the, the, how we created mass public support for the boycott, mm -hmm. two, how we, uh, all of our activities needed to be uh, framed in order to be able to get media coverage so that we could expand our message on a broader basis than we were able to do with a leaflet or with a conversation in front of a store. Uh, and then uh, that uh, we had to uh, uh, cultivate uh, the support of the community uh, financially, 
and, and in other ways to be able to maintain the operation of the organization. And then uh, we also had to recruit our own people locally because there weren't enough farm workers uh, at the time, you know, that could be sent to the cities. And the local people have fam were familiar with their local areas and could be more effective in terms of carrying the message. And I have another question that is related to the boycott, but I think is also general and also piggybacking with what some of the mm -hmm. questions that Ken asked you. How important was to be bilingual? Because oh. you're fully bilingual, and obviously you can reach uh, two different audiences with two different messages for two different purposes, mm -hmm. right? So absolutely, you know, because in, in all of these places, you know, particularly in the west and in the east. And in, and, in, and to a large degree in the in the Midwest, where it's a, uh, a huge uh, Latino communities, you know, in Chicago we had a huge Puerto Rican and and, and Mexican Mexico. community, mm -hmm. New York huge uh, uh, Caribbean, Puerto Rican, Dominicans, and others, uh, smaller Mexican community, and you needed to be able to communicate with them because there was both uh, the, the, the church, which was catering to the Spanish-speaking uh, community, the media, the Omnivisiones mm -hmm. at the time, the radio stations, uh, the newspapers are very b vibrant in all of these places, uh, 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 Latino media. And so to me, uh, uh, as a bilingual person, I found it a huge advantage that that some of my monolingual English speakers' uh, colleagues were not able to reach the same uh, communities. And, and because of that, somewhat they were a little bit more limited to who they could appeal to. And it allowed us to be able to build a much broader coalition, you know, by being able to communicate. And piggybacking with what Ken asked you before, is was your how did you convince Spanish speakers? Was that different than you what you, the way you did you convey that message to to English speakers? The background I, I, I thought uh, well, uh, when I I talked to Spanish speakers, you know, like it wasn't hard to explain to people why what the farm workers needed. That was their experience too. Mm -hmm. You know, they most of them were immigrants or rec or or recent or the children of immigrants. So it wasn't something they didn't know about or have experienced themselves. It was very easy to gather their support. Uh, and whenever we went uh, to a church, for example, and the priest would let us sometimes do the homily, if you can believe that. We always got tremendous support, tremendous support. Uh, and when I went to, for example, in Chicago to the steel mills of East Chicago, Indiana, you know, heavy Latino background in South Chicago and East Chicago, the Latino community uh, uh, membership there was huge, huge in terms of gathering the support of the whole local. Uh, because they were a very important part of that union. So, so uh, for them, it, uh, li like the black community, what my experience from, 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 oh, uh, from the beginning, that union, union people, uh, uh, people of color, and young people were no-brainer people. They were always there. They understood it and were uh, up for it. I tell you, I, you know, I, I always kidded that uh, they, I had all these uh, high school kids giving me their lunch money, you know, for I would leave some of their classes with a bunch of quarters and dimes and all of that. Yeah. It, was, it was a great experience uh, of going out, especially talking to the young people, because boy, uh, people, young people were the best. We're ready to get engaged, right? Yeah, uh, and it caught my attention in, in rereading Medium's, Medium's book. Is a lot of the operations are named in Spanish, mm -hmm. like you said, Operación Maraña, Operación. I think it was the the the, the broom one, the Scoba, right? So why was that? What do you think it was that? 
you and mean how these operations were named? Uh, are you talking ab uh, about in the boycott? I'm not talking about the field. Just offices. in general, right? It just in general, in the in the in the different different activities that you guys. Well, did. in 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 particular in the fields, a lot of the campaigns that we did, it was sort of in fun because in many ways, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do is make people conscious of their own power. Mm -hmm. And, and being able to have, like, uh, I know Marshall and some of his campaigns, uh, they, uh, they had came up with a, something called Operación Canguro. <laughs> In Oxnard, we came up with a plan uh, that we called uh, uh, El Plan Escoba. Uh -huh. And the people said, ¿Qué es El Plan Escoba? Well, what it was is that we had a bunch of strikers that were not busy doing anything other than standing in front of the place. So we said, well, look, what we need you guys to do is we need you to go out to every community in the Oxnard Plain, knock on every door, and sign up every person there to uh, on a card for the union, because we want to organize this whole area into the union. And we saw, and they said, well, uh, ¿por qué plan escoba? Porque van a barrer con todo. <laughs> Todo. And they said, okay. And so they did. They went out and they signed up police officers, housewives, and factory workers, and all of that. And then we, out of that, then we wound up with a couple, several thousand farm worker authorization cards and as leads to go out and organize their companies. We had another one we, uh, when we went, had a strike of lemon workers that we called it El, El Plantalón. <laughs> and then they said, well, what's that? Well, van a talonear apoyo de los comerciantes, <laughs> de todos vayan ahí y, 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 y consigan el apoyo de restaurantes y todos que para que apoyen los, la huelga. So they went on, they talked to the merchants, and the merchants, uh, they gave them a bunch of uh, uh, bags of food and, and all kinds of stuff for the strike kitchen, you know? And so it was like this, we had... And, and people thought that was fun, but it also related to our culture, you know, about what it, mm -hmm. how it is that you go in and you work on it. And, and a lot of it was that we wanted them to also have a sense of themselves and their community and the role that they played in it, and that it wasn't just them alone, that they, in fact, had all of these people out there that had a stake in their success. And, and you know, I, a lot of it is just from what we learned in the boycott too, and and uh, and it also is is a lot, you know, like in Delano when we had the the, the, the strike, you know, that the big thing or during the march was el, el plan de Delano, mm -hmm. which goes back to el plan de Ayala and of all of these plans, yeah. you know, that where you lay out what your goals are, and and what your issues are. So it, it, it's cultural some some, but it also is a rallying cry, mm -hmm. you know, of what you're fighting for. Yes. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and we skipped over it, is when you were speaking to different whomever, did you detail, okay, let me back up, you know, when you first heard Chavez speak on that very first day, and he, and he said, look, I'm one of you. We lost our farm. I've been on the road sleeping in the car and ditches and whatnot all these years, and I know what your situation is because I've lived it. Did you use those kind of descriptors about how farm workers were living more than just to say they're they're growing food that they can't afford to eat, but here's how they're living and what goes on in families. Did you rely on those things in the yeah in the presentation to yeah. make them explicit the conditions of the farm workers? Yeah, you know it was even your own. We did, you know, because uh, we believe very strongly in organizing in the story. Mm -hmm. That you have to tell your story, mm -hmm. not just about 
have it be a story about poor us, mm -hmm. but it's got to be a story about your dreams and your hopes mm -hmm. and what stands in the way of, of your dreams coming true. And you got to be able to say, this is what our reality is. This is what it is today. This is what we're trying to change. This is what we're doing, and this is what we're doing, and here's how you can help. So, yeah, I mean, it, I, 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 we were very clear in explaining to people about the conditions that people lived in and why they were wrong. I talk a lot about, in, in all of that, is, is how I felt so bad working in the fields at the lack of dignity when you don't have toilets in the fields and you are forced to go out and uh, if you need to go relieve yourself to go hide underneath, uh, behind a tree or underneath a grapevine, and particularly humiliating, I wanted to, I said to people, is how I felt when I saw my sister and my mother, when they had to go do that, you know, uh, and they would have to go and sort of hide behind, uh, each other in order to be able to relieve themselves because there was no way that the growers provided toilets so that you could safeguard your dignity and your and your uh, uh, and you know for you and mm -hmm. and and it still you know made me angry that people have to do that and and people understood and say that's not right so yeah so we told that story but again. It was, a, but it was more a story of hope rather than a, a story of despair. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think people people got that whether they were uh, whether they were uh, in a union, whether they were in a church, whether they were a student, or were they, people just felt that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, so that story was was critical. And and what made it more believable is because it was somebody of me that had lived it rather than heard about it. Mm -hmm. And that made uh, uh, us as farm workers when we were out there, uh, you know, m much, much more effective in terms of the message that we were able to carry. And you asked about women, you know, because mm -hmm. particularly our women sharing those kinds of stories, you know, uh, were even more effective in, in, in convincing people that this was wrong. This was not the America that we all talk about, that we're proud of. And yes, uh, there's a lot good in this country, but there's also a lot of things that are wrong that need to be corrected. And, and, and it was, I thought that, that people responded to it. You know, I mean, uh, we would not have been successful if people hadn't heard and believed and acted on their beliefs when they heard that story. Mm -hmm. And it, everything from a high school kid giving me a, their quarter for lunch to uh, a union buying us clothes to people get, being arrested for uh, sit -in, doing a sit-in, you know, at a store. People made real sacrifices, you know, t uh, for this union, but, mm -hmm. uh, but they felt good doing it, you know, because they felt that there was also an affirmation of their beliefs and their values uh, of what they themselves thought they stood for and believed in. So I tell you, it was uh, that boycott was a tremendous, a tremendous experience, and those of us that went through it, you know, came out of it a uh, way different person than when we showed up at the. Uh, front door of a supporter in Chicago saying, I'm here to do the boycott. <laughs> I have another off the wall question. It doesn't fit with anything. In Miriam's book, you mentioned that uh, she, she says that you talked about hating to work in the potatoes. That talked about what? I'm sorry, I didn't. Hated, how much you hated to work in the potatoes? Okay, <laughs> I did. 